Hey, readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and this is Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. I'm joining this episode by Jackson Ford, author of The Frost Files, a modern-day sci-fi series which follows the misadventures of telekinetic and involuntary government operative Tegan Frost. The series includes The Girl Who Could Move Shit With Her Mind and Random Shit Flying Through the Air, both of which are available now. The third book, Eye of the Shitstorm, arrives April 27th from Orbit Books. And Jackson, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you so much for having me, man. Pleasure to be here. Two things worth noting. One, I've never had to swear in my opening before. Uh, so that's a novel and interesting and fun new thing. Secondly, it's going to be so weird to me to try to address you as Jackson Ford, since I, of course, know you as Rob Bofford. We met years ago. It feels like a decade ago, but it was probably like three or four years ago at Emerald City Comic Con because we were doing a panel together there. Uh, we were on it with uh, Fonda Lee, I think. Um, so, you know, pretty good author pedigree on that one. And so I knew you at that particular moment in time uh, as a, you know, like interstellar sci fi writer and you've got a ton of books under you know your umbrella under that name but uh back in 2019 this novel first appeared or the 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 girl who could move shit with her mind and the identity of the author was kept secret for a long stretch and i mean and it was kind of funny reading things on like goodreads and and book twitter where people were trying to sort out your identity and all that stuff um and it seemed like i mean it was Nobody knew for a really long stretch. I mean, I didn't know until I, I saw you, like, you know, switch your Twitter handle one day with it. So, I mean, before we even get started on the books, I want to know what was the decision making for, like, you know, creating a pseudonym, switching that as far as, like, you know, marketing and, and you know, getting yourself placed on bookshelves and, and just the hiding your identity for a little while while this was coming out. Like, what was behind all of that? So when I wrote The Girl Who Can Move Shit With Her Mind, it was so wildly different to, to anything, anything I'd done before, any book. Um, and so we looked at this and went, well, it would be cool to do this under a pseudonym, to completely separate it from the Rob Buffard books. Um, and because bookstores and readers will get a lot more excited about the first Jackson Ford book than they will about the fifth Rob Buffard book. So I looked at this and I was a little bit resistant to doing a pseudonym at first. But after all, I was like, all right, let's roll with this. And just kind of, we kept having conversations about it and how to do it. And I don't remember who pitched the idea of keeping it a secret. I think it may have been my agent, Ed Wilson. But I kind of looked at this and went, actually, I kind of like that. I like the idea that nobody knows who this guy is because this book is going to make a splash with that title and with the level of quality. And I was really proud of how the book came out. I knew it was going to do well. And I liked the idea of people not knowing who Jackson Ford was. And it's like you said, it was, there was a fair amount of discussion about who the hell is this guy? And I saw some, some really weird suggestions, but some people thought I was Sean and Maguire, which I don't <laughs> really understand. I was like, I'm, A, I'm nowhere near that talented and B, that's, the style's just way too different. And there was one person who guessed correctly and who messaged me on Facebook, but he was the only one. No one else knew. And so for about a year until until midway through last year, we we kept it a secret and we managed to keep it under wraps. And I think it worked quite nicely. I when I was looking at it, uh, even just kind of going through the backlogs of comments on it, I saw people conjecture Mark Lawrence. I thought saw somebody who said Patrick Rothfuss, which I thought was hysterical. <laughs> you kidding? Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. I forget which forum I saw it wow. on, but where people were just like throwing around names. I think it was pre-release of the novel, but it was everybody just trying to figure out like, I think they were trying to think like, who would be like a person, you know, that wrote you know, maybe less irreverent type of fiction who wanted to like really go out there swinging with something different so that it would be so off brand for them that they would need a new name and they'd need to kind of have some subterfuge for a while. And I, I saw several others besides, but, um, but, but it was, it was very amusing to, to see it. I think it's, um, I think I saw you post something the other day. So, I mean, I've got, you know, the girl who yes, can move in your mind in front of me. I, this is on its, what, sixth printing? Now six or seven. So, yeah, I think, think six printing. Yeah, it's done. It it's picked up a, a nice a nice fan base. People really enjoy that one. Clearly, in especially in the age of of when we could go to books bookstores, and some people can uh, or do. I don't because I'm terrified of everything. But otherwise, like you know, you can still go into the store and, and get stuff. It's the kind of thing that's going to jump off the shelf at you. Hundred um, percent. Yeah, and um, you know, and it's got a fun cover, and it's got some. 
There's one thing that I think is funny about it, and we'll get into it in a bit, but it's that like that there's there's a dog up here in the corner. Yep. There's and... there's an animal on every single one of the covers in each book in the series. There's a different animal. So the second one's a cat. The third one I think is a goldfish. We haven't locked down the the cover for the for the fourth one, which is coming next year. I don't know what's going to be on that. A lizard, maybe. A gecko. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, like. Orbit us. I mean, I'm terrible at titles. This is just my Achilles heel. I suck at them, but I work with people who are really, really, really good at them. And when my editor Anna came out and said, Hey, we want to call it the girl who proves you with a mind, I've never said yes faster in my life. I was just like, That is perfect. <laughs> that is absolutely spot on. Yes, let's do it. Well, it was, it was definitely an inspired choice. Um, I do think the animal thing is weird just because, I mean, going into that first novel, we know that Tekken can't actually move organic matter. Uh, and living yeah. creatures. So I looked at it and I was like, wait a second. What are we doing here? Um, but uh, don't, don't, but we'll... don't think too hard about it, mate. Don't think too hard about it. <laughs> Flying dog, just roll with it. Just roll yeah. with it. But I think um, that probably gives us a good moment to transition into you kind of do, giving your elevator pitch for the, the novels, for the series. Like when you're talking about it now um, and, you know, and three books in. So it's always complicated enough to describe one novel, trying to figure out how to explain a whole series of them gets even more challenging, I think. But uh, but yeah, what what is that for you? How do you pitch this this series? So the series asks the question: What would happen if you had superpowers but you didn't want them? And uh, it explores the story of Tegan Frost, who was genetically engineered by her parents to have psychokinesis, the ability to move shit with her mind. Uh, she is forced to work for the government in Los Angeles as part of a secret agent black bag crew uh, who goes off and does various jobs. Uh, but all she wants to do is live a normal life, be a chef and own her own restaurant. And the series is the story of her adventures, how she deals with being forced to work for the government, having these superpowers when she wants neither, and uh, the scrapes that uh, she and her crew get into. I really like the fact that it's the turnaround where I think a lot of us, especially those of us who grew up with comic books and, and superhero stuff, with the idea of like having telekinesis is like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome, I wish I had that. And to have it flipped around to have somebody who has the ability and wants to have a mundane life. That her fascination with food and great restaurants and wanting to open up her own shop and stuff like that, she wants nothing to do with this thing that she's been saddled with because it's only been a pain in the ass for her. Um, I like that angle a lot. The marketing for this um, often refers to it as Alias meets X-Men. Uh, the X-Men part, I totally get. I have never seen Alias. All I know about it is it's Jennifer Garner with a bunch of co funny colored wigs. Um, so I don't know much about the premise of it otherwise, so I don't know where that meets. But for me... I was struck by the fact that it felt like these novels were kind of structured like almost like classic noir detective stories in a way, um, because there's just something about like noir detective stories are all about starting off in a kind of low place and only getting lower. And that's what it kind of felt like in the in the first novel, like how Tegan's life is starts off in a place where it's it's comfortable enough, but certainly not what she would want out of her existence. And then you know, shit goes downhill fast and continues to go that way. But then there's, of course, layers of sort of gonzo sci-fi um, and uh, a lot of irreverent humor and the stakes only get bigger and crazier and more sci-fi as it goes along. So I'm curious, like genre wise, like what do you where do you think this kind of falls into and like what's the target reader for this? Man, oh, man. OK, so genre, dude, I'll be honest to this day. I still don't know what genre these stories fit into. I certainly didn't start writing them and think, oh, I'm writing a sci-fi story now or I'm writing a, a young adult thriller or whatever. I, I didn't go into it like that. I never do with the book. I've been told it's it, these are kind of superhero fantasy and I kind of shrug my shoulders and go, okay. But to my mind, yeah, they pull from so many different genres. There is, you know, classic classic crime and detective noir in there. There are sci-fi and fantastical elements. There's action thriller. There's all these things that I've kind of chucked in and have and really had fun playing around with. And I don't think it fits into one particular genre. Unlike a lot of sci-fi authors, I didn't grow up, you know, reading classic sci-fi and being a Star Wars geek. I grew up as uh, you know, as a as a fan of, of mystery writers, I grew up as a fan of Ed McBain and Jeffrey Deaver and Raymond Chandler and all all of these guys, um, and that that's kind of what informs my writing. So honestly, I'm really reluctant to put this book into a particular genre. It, it just feels weird to me. I don't want to I don't want to pigeonhole it or box it in. Um, in terms of target audience, though, the target audience for the for the series um, is a lot younger. 
They're sort of the, in the, the 25 and under group, which is fantastic because these people are super, super passionate. Um, I, I don't have any data to back it up, but they've turned out to be, as far as I can tell, mostly women, which is also fantastic. Basically, I have the best fucking readers on planet Earth, man. I love my readers. But in terms of like who I was writing it for when I first started writing it, I wasn't writing it for one group. I wasn't going and saying, I want to write for you know, young adults. I want to write for 30 plus sci-fi fans. That's, again, that's not really how I work. I just went, went in going, I want to tell a story that I like. I want to have the most fun possible writing this book. I want to tell a story that could only have come from me. And um, we'll, you know, we'll figure out who it's for later. For now, the story is for me. And as it turns out, it's, it's the response it's been getting. It, I've landed the best readers on earth, man. I think it's also, I, in a weird way, a great time for a series like this because, no, nice well, in the middle of like a pandemic where everything is very grim, where politically everything is a mess. So many of the, the interviews that I've had on this show have been talking with people who inadvertently, presciently wrote about um, pandemics or about insurrections right. or stuff like that. Like, and um, it's for me, I, I'm, I'm not the kind of person where when I'm down, I want to go seek out things that get me further down. I'm just not built that way. Um, yeah. So it's been it's been a challenge to dive into a lot of things that have these apocalyptic things or dy dystopian themes to them. So having something that has a flair for fun for a witty protagonist, for a world that's a little less serious. Uh, that's just refreshing. And I, I got to think that in a moment where people need some escape, where they need something that's a little bit more popcorn film in their book, um, that you know gives them something that has a lot to say, but also has a good time doing it, that's what these books deliver. And, uh, and so I think the moment is really, really strong for them in a lot of ways. Um, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of you to say, man. Thank you. I mean, like, I've, 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 one thing I've always said about this series is the books go to some really dark places, but they always find their way back. I'm very happy to be writing something that's a little bit more flippant, a little bit more fuck you than the other books out there. It's not going to make you want to throw yourself off a cliff. It's not necessarily going to reflect the reality we're living in right now. And that's, that's, uh, that's very deliberate. I, I found that very refreshing. And I felt that, um, you know, I mean, there's there's definitely a time and a place to dig into those things that are darker, that that um, hurt you a little bit on the way towards um, getting to their point. Uh, but, oh, my gosh, all of us need something that takes us back towards the light and gives us a little bit more hope along the way and just reminds us that, you know, genre fiction can be a really good time while still having something to say. All that being noted, I mean, the world of this story is contemporary modern day um, and in and in particular, Los Angeles. Um, and I want to dig into that a little bit um, because I, it, it was my understanding that for the first novel, uh, I mean, you are a world traveler and have lived all over the place. But I think in the in writing the first novel, I don't know that you have, had actually been to Los Angeles. No, I, I very definitely had been to Los Angeles. Uh, that oh, was okay. just a, that was just me fucking around with the the Jackson <laughs> Ford bio because no one knew who he was, and I was like, well, Tegan Tegan, the main character, is going to write Jackson Ford's bio, and she's going to be fucking Assenheim. So no, I, I have very, I have very definitely been to Los Angeles. I've spent quite a bit of time there. Um, that, that makes me feel better because you do, I mean, as somebody who has spent some time in LA, um, you do nail the feel of the city in a big way and reading it, I was like, this doesn't seem like somebody who hasn't been here, but everything that I had read, um, you know, again, it was, you know, it, it's screwing with us in the, uh, the bio, but yeah, please continue. <laughs> so I think in like 2012 or 2013, I did a short journalism fellowship at the University of Southern California, which was incredible because it was basically a massive all expenses paid trip where they took you around Los Angeles. They took a group of journalists from all over the place around LA and we really got to absorb the culture of the city, uh, the theater scene, the art scene, um, landscapes. We did a whole tour based around the neon signs in downtown. We just got thrown headlong into this and Ever since then, I've kind of looked at LA as a city that just has these amazing hidden depths and this amazing other side to it that most tourists don't see. And, you know, I've gone back there sporadically over the years and I've spent quite a bit of time there. Um, but I will say that, like, I couldn't, I'm really glad you, you know, you, you found that the description of, of descriptions of LA spot on. I will say that I couldn't have done it without help. I have a, an LA-based uh, journalist called Alicia Grasso, who I work with. Um, she checks all my facts for me. I will literally send her the completed draft and be like, yo, tell me where it's bullshit. Tell me where I've really screwed up. And she does, which is good. Um, so she makes sure that I'm not, I'm portraying the city as, a, as it should, because that's important to me. Like, 
LA is such a big part of Tegan's world. I want to get it right. I want someone who lives in the city to read it and be like, this is where, this is where I live. This is spot on. That means a lot to me. So I'm really glad that you, uh, that you found it spot on. One of the things I'm, I'm interested uh, when it comes to uh, placing stories in real world locales is the level of detail and specificity um, that people go into. And it seems like, especially when you write about big cities, if you if you write about New York City, you write about L.A., you'll write about London. There tends to be a lot of details with regard to like these are the street the, the street names. Here are the neighborhoods. Here are, you know, like a lot of like, you know, it's at the corner of something and something. It always seems like the people who are from those locales, they are really into those details because it's their world. They see it portrayed on the page versus people who are maybe elsewhere who don't know those spaces as well might read it and be like, OK, that gives me a sense of where I'm going, but I don't. I don't know that I need that as much. I'm curious for you um, in thinking about that in constructing the narrative and basically because when I we talk a lot about world building on this show and in this case, the world building is much more about the details of Tegan's powers and, and sort of the governmental operation behind it. The rest of it is a world that exists for us in a very real way, especially when you talk about things like Skid Row and just the nature of the city. So when you're approaching that hyper specific kind of local detail, you know, who do you have in mind for that? Is that is it specifically for kind of the people who are like in L.A. and or know the space very well and they feel that? Is it a, for a verisimilitude for the people who are approaching it otherwise? Like, I, I just I'm just curious your consideration for that. I think it's a mix of both. Um, I want the story to appeal to people who have never been to L.A. as much as I want it to appeal to people who live in L.A. And it is it's it's quite challenging to to strike that balance that you describe. You know, I want to be able to to reference real streets and, you know, uh, real areas, but I don't want to fetishize, fetishize it. Because if I, I say, you know, this thing happened at the corner of X and X streets in downtown LA or in uh, Santa Monica or wherever, you know, someone who hasn't been to LA, it's not going to mean much. I'm more interested in what does the place look like? What does it smell like? What are the little details on the street? What are the things that are specific to LA? What are the cars? How many of them are not uh, Priuses? Like that kind of thing. I'm interested in these these small little details because that's what jumps out at me when I walk down a city street. I'm not super interested in the name of the street necessarily or exactly where I am on a map. I'm interested in what is this particular area like? What vibe am I getting from it? And so when you're in Skid Row, yeah, you could. I could talk about the exact specific building at this exact corner. Or like, I've got a particular scene in the first book that happens outside the LA Mission, which is a big homeless shelter. I'm not going to go on and on about the LA Mission. I'm going to do the bare minimum to capture it and leave the rest to the reader's imagination, because to me, that hits both targets. That means that someone who lives in LA will know what I'm talking about, and someone who doesn't live in LA will still get a sense of the place more than the actual location. You know, I live on Google Maps when I'm writing these books. I'm constantly looking back and forth. But just because I live on Google Maps doesn't mean I want my readers to. Oh, that makes perfect sense. I think that looking at the story through Tegan's eyes, because uh, most of the story is first person POV, uh, although the antagonists show up as a third person. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, but considering that this is Tegan's world, this is what she exists in. We get her own kind of running commentary about these spaces as well. You know, we understand through her eyes that, you know, she loves this city. She loves the culture of this city, but she knows that parts of it are dangerous. Parts of it have huge economic uh, and social disadvantages. It's been kind of uh, funky for me because like the last week I've been watching this uh, this Netflix documentary series that I'm going to get the name wrong where it's like scene of the crime or crime scene, but it's about the death of Elisa Lamb and a big part of that documentary is Skid Row, understanding the five city blocks or so that it takes up, how it, you know, it revolves around these different missions, how it's near this, this the, the Cecil Hotel, all of this kinds of stuff. And so it was kind of funny for me because, I mean, I have seen Skid Row in person being in LA. I read about it here in, in your story and had those like, oh, oh yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've been in the cab driving by those things and the, the cabbie being like, you know, telling me as an out of town or like, okay, don't ever go here. You know, it's not safe for you in this zone. Um, the places where I would, you know, be at a coffee shop and have friends who'd be texting me and saying, oh, we'll come pick you up. Don't, don't walk around out there, you know, stuff like that, where, you know, there's these very real concerns. And I mean, I'm from St. Louis. We know how that works. Uh, you know, that like, you know, there are places where you, you feel a little, little concerned if you're out in the evening. But, Bro, uh, I'm, but from, I'm from, I'm from Johannesburg. Why do you think I'm so attuned to this? 
Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, I mean, if you kind of you come from these environments, you know, there are a lot of places that are very um, can be very challenging to be in. And there's a lot of layers for why they're the way they are. They might be full of people who would like to hurt you or take advantage of you. But there's a lot of desperate people who just need help and have been refused it. Um, and uh, and we see a lot of that through Tegan's eyes. And so she really feel, you know, fills in a lot of that information for us and contextualizes those things, which I think is very important for somebody who may have never seen the city or known just how difficult some of those things can be um beyond all that though tegan has the advantage of or disadvantage depending on how her own perspective goes of being a psychokinetic i think people are probably familiar with the idea of telekinesis but tegan's particular abilities they have some limitations um they at least as the story begins you know there's there are kind of like some things that she can and can't do there are abilities that she can kind of touch on but it put, takes a lot of extra pushing to get there um i want to know how in like you describe that like how that works what tegan is working with um and then thinking about how those powers evolve over the series without getting too spoilerly but i think kind of giving an idea of people what they're what they're in for so to start with tegan is is she's she's not omnipotent she has telekinesis psychokinesis but she can only lift objects up to a certain weight i think about 300 pounds i'm gonna i'm gonna get these numbers wrong watch me um she can lift up to about 300 pounds and out to about 30 feet and she cannot lift organic matter if it's inorganic metal plastic what have you all good human beings not so much that's where she starts with you know i wanted to have limitations on her powers certainly at first i didn't want to have her be able to just you know, reach two miles down the street with her mind and lift up a car and throw it across the city. I mean, that now that I've said that, that sounds kind of fun, but that's not what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn, I should have put that in. No, um, I wanted her to start like that. Firstly, because, you know, it's fun to have limitations because it puts it can put your, your character into some quite, it's quite hairy situations which you might not be able to get out of. And two, because I wanted to allow room for growth. Her powers do grow throughout the series and without spoiling things necessarily they start to introduce you know as she gets stronger and more able to lift certain things there are complications that come with that not just from the fact that you know it's it's about how about how she views her own powers and what happens to her own body when she uses them but what do the people she work for start thinking if she suddenly becomes a lot stronger how inclined are they to keep her in the same situation? Are they likely to start using her differently? Are they likely to want to drag her back to a government lab for more studies? So she has to be very careful. I think that's one of the things with Tegan is, you know, everybody thinks it'd be cool to have psychokinesis, but in her situation, she has to pay attention to how she's using it all the time. She has to use it with intent. And that can become very exhausting and she is hugely resentful of the fact that she has to do that because it's just this extra thing she needs to think about. So yeah, those, those I introduced those, those limitations very deliberately and I play with them quite a bit throughout the series. I didn't want an omnipotent character. I didn't want to throw a car across the city. Although I think I'm going to put that in a future book. Cause like I said, that sounds fun. <laughs> well, you know, in, when we look at like magic systems and stuff in fantasy novels, a lot of the discussion about constructing those things is cost is looking at like if you can give people a significant amount of power there should be a balance somewhere in there there should be some type of give and take for it um in this particular instance with tegan it's exhausting um it, it draws a lot of her own physical power and strength and stability in order to be able to use these abilities the first book starts with her and another character basically chucking themselves out of a skyscraper window and then her having to figure out a way to use her ability to save them from going splat, um, you know, 80 feet or 80 stories <laughs> below. Um, and there's a cost to that, um, you know, that afterwards that she is hurting essentially. And later on, she gets pushed past the barrier of where she thought she could go and she accomplishes something she never thought would be possible. But at the same time, the physical toll for that, is is pretty immense and something that she is trying really hard to shake off afterwards so i think it's always important to kind of have those those back and forth from a writing standpoint though um anytime that you have a story where there are powers where there are MacGuffins, there are things that uh you know that normal people can't do there can be the the situations that arise where you write yourself into a corner where you're like oh the character um you know has this thing happening and there should just be an easy fix because they have superpowers 
And it's awful when you read a novel and you get to that place where it's just somebody just forgets they have something. It makes me think of, even though it's a fun movie, uh, there's the film Shazam uh, that came out a couple of years ago. And in the final fight, Shazam just forgets he has electrical powers and he just goes yeah, straight. Nice. Yeah, he just straight fisticuffs for all the final fight. And but the whole movie, he's been walking around throwing zappiness like all over the place. And then at the final he blows up the dude's phone, doesn't he? Like walking right. through the shopping center. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the sticks of him is that he controls lightning. And then they get into the final fight and it just goes away. He just doesn't think about it until like his family gets elevated to their you know, basically the Marvel family is Shazam family. And, and um, you know, and they kind of get separate abilities as well. Um, hmm. But it's things like that where like you know getting to that moment and then conveniently forgetting something exists because it you know it would make things easier or harder on on the person writing that are there places in these novels where you came up into a moment where you're like oh this will be great and you're like oh no she'd be able to get through that really really easily like and how did you handle them if you encountered that pretty much every single day of writing i had a situation <laughs> like that no honestly and and i'm constantly paying attention to that because i hate this as much as you do i don't want Tegan to forget that she has psychokinesis and and it annoys the hell out of me as a reader when that happens and I, I I was really paying attention to it which was the problem because how am I supposed to come up for, with situations that Tegan can't handle when she can move th move shit with her mind you're gonna come at her with a gun no you're not she's not only gonna stop you taking it out of the holster she's gonna lock down the safety and probably just rip it away from you you're like so I I have to constantly think all right what are situations that would test her? What are situations that she cannot just brute force her way out of? And that's where a lot of the mental energy for me goes. And, you know, it's exhausting, but it's a lot of fun. And, you know, the limitations do help. We've, we've already discussed those. But, like, I view Tegan almost like a, like a weightlifter or someone working in the gym. You know, even when you think you're benching the max weight you possibly can, you're probably only using about 60% of your strength and your body and your brain are going, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. You can't go anymore, but you can. And it's busting through those limits that, that, that makes this a lot of fun for me. But yeah, um, I spend a lot of time walking up and down my little office, swearing at my computer screen going, no, shit, that can't possibly work. I can't have her do that because she'll just, why doesn't she just use her powers and just zoom out of there? Like, Drives me insane, man. But, you know, I've, I have good editors and we work hard at this. So I think, fingers crossed, up to this point, Tegan's never forgotten that she has psychokinesis. She's never been in a situation where she's suddenly like, oh, no, what will I do? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, when it's that ingrained into the person, I mean, it, it would be like us forgetting that we can stand or forgetting that we can throw a punch or whatever those things exactly. are. Like, if it's something you do all the time you're conditioned to use it. So, um, yeah, remembering that's kind of important. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that, that Tegan as a character is no stoic superhero and no super spy. She's kind of a disaster human, um, barely keeping herself together. Her relationships are a mess. Her background has meant that because like you mentioned earlier, uh, her, her parents created these powers for her. Then she basically ended up in a, like a government black op site where um, they just poked and prodded her trying to figure out how to make this happen and how to weaponize her until they found that there was a finite limit to what she could do. And then they were like, okay, you can go work for us as part of this little operation out of LA, or we can dissect you and, you know, put you away forever. And she was like, okay, I guess I'll go take the job because being that versus being a Guinea pig um, or dead is you know, a better option. So yeah, so she's got this job with this little group that are kind of called the, the China shop movers because they, they have a front where they actually do the actual job of going out and moving things, which is a note that I love because I like, if you're going to have a front, it has to actually work. People have to see it in, in motion. They have to be able to say, Oh no, no, those guys, they moved my house last week, you know, because that's your best kind of alibi is when you've actually done the work. And I'll yeah. talk more about them in a minute, but Thinking about Tegan, uh, this is a character with an extremely specific point of view. She's very witty. She's very sardonic. She's a little cavalier. Uh, she's maybe she's the kind of POV that I think some people are going to relate to immediately and they like and really dig into. And other people who are maybe perhaps a little bit more cynical or be like, ah, oh, no, I can't stand being with a person like this. This is going to be difficult. So for you in constructing this kind of character and 
thinking about editorial feedback, especially in the first novel, getting her right, figuring out that tone. What were, what were those conversations like where, you know, you want to get her voice, um, that particular type of repartee that she has and um, and that kind of commentary while making sure that it will be an accessible character that people enjoy being with? When I first sent this book to Orbit and I got my, my edit notes back, we had plenty to fix because my first drafts are a mess. The one thing we never, ever had to fix and the one thing that stayed the same throughout was the voice. The voice never changed. The voice was always there. The voice is me. Tegan is a very different person to me in a lot of ways, but her voice, that's my voice. That's what I went into writing this book. I was just like, I am just going to be me. This isn't going to be a, a space a space opera, a space thriller type thing where I've got a lot of different characters and they all have different personalities. I've put in a whole bunch of different voices. No. Tegan Frost's voice is going to be me. I'm going to write like I would write, no one else. And it just worked. And I'm very, very happy with the fact that it just worked and people by and large love it. And yeah, you're right. There are some people who go, oh, this is this character's fucking annoying. I can't stand her. She's, you know, snarky and sarcastic <laughs> and immature. And I'm like, yep, that's kind of bang on the money. And if you if that's how you feel, then we're probably not going to be friends anyway. So screw you man um <laughs> but yeah so the, the voice never changed and that voice is me and that is how it, i've been told in the past that i write how i speak and i speak how i write so yeah by and large it's me you're reading on the page i'm a, I'm a different character you know there's that old joke about you know the author inserts in a book so the author inserting himself or herself into the narrative well you know hands up i inserted myself into that narrative because tegan is an alternate version of me much cooler than me but still an alternate version well i mean and every character on the page is some sliver of of the writer's psyche right um there's just some that reflect yeah, tegan is like a others. massive slice of the psyche it's like a massive <laughs> like half the pie Oh, I mean, for sure. I mean, when I when I actually was reading these like ahead of our interview, this was the first time I'd gotten my hands on them. And so by that point, I already knew it was you. And I mean, I've only been around you in person on one time, but I, I, I there was yeah. enough time to kind of get a sense of your voice and personality. And I could feel that come through in a big way. So I would like to think that if it back in the day when nobody knew who this was actually written by, that I might have been able to figure that out if I was reading it at the time, because I knew how you speak and how you think a little bit but yeah it does come through on the page I, I i do get that in a big way pov wise like i said earlier tegan is is a first person perspective um which again lends itself to the immediacy of the story being able to very quickly get into her head to see her vision of la and also i think just in general like um first person povs allow a certain level of intimacy and directness um that like third person on the omniscience and stuff don't necessarily um there's an emotional immediate connection however there are second povs in this um in the first novel we get this this other character who we, we start off the novel with tegan believing she's the only person who has this ability we find out very quickly that there is another guy wandering around Los Angeles who has this power. He's just come into to town recently, and he's on a mission trying to figure out his own background and stuff. When we get into the second novel, we have a four-year-old disaster child who can cause earthquakes, which is a whole other thing. And then in the third novel, we have this electrically powered person. And we get these people as secondary um, POVs that, you know, that we're not getting that first person kind of experience. What made you choose that kind of set up and was that something from the very beginning you knew you were going to have to head hop a little bit in order to to make those narratives work or is that something that you kind of figured out while you were writing it i love that term head hopping i've head hopped since my very first book as rob buffard back in the day i've always been head hopping for me it feels like i'm in the pocket when i'm doing it it feels like i have this central character with the first person with the first person point of view and that's kind of the anchor around which I, I base the entire story and I can go out to these little satellites, which is the, the secondary and tertiary characters who are third person. And I feel like it gives me a little bit of distance from them because they're usually bad guys, to, you know, more or less. And I don't necessarily want to be completely in a bad guy's head. I want to be outside them a little bit and get a bit more distance, partly because everybody thinks they're the good guy. Even the bad guy thinks they're the mm -hmm. good guy. And so I feel like if I'm in the bad guy's head and it's another first person point of view, it feels a little one-sided to me in a way that Tegan doesn't. And so I want to be outside the bad guy's head. I want to be viewing their actions and I want to be 
not necessarily judging them, but maybe trying to explain their actions from that point of view. But mostly, like I say, that's just kind of where I'm comfortable. I mean, I've, I've written books in the past where all the characters have third person points of view. I haven't written a completely first person point of view yet book yet, but yeah, this is just where I'm comfortable right in that pocket. Also, a thing I think is worth kind of taking a look at, I think a lot about pacing because pacing can make or break a novel. These books fly. I mean, they're like, they get up and go. I mean, right from the, you know, the first novel where like you're, you're falling through the sky and it's almost a record scratch of like, you know, how did I end up here? You know, and you kind of kind of have to back up from it. Um, but at the same time, Tegan has to kind of give us a lot of information as we go along. And then and as we get into these other antagonists, you know, we get these kind of very strategic info dumps. And I feel like uh, especially as she's contextualizing the world for the reader, she has to give us an occasional pause and be like, OK, here's a character who's entered in. It's almost like my brain could see a visual of it where it'd be like, OK, here's the other the other members of her team. They step in and it's almost like freeze frame and there's the guy. And then like the 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 the, the thing about like the ID cards that used to be up on the back of G.I. Joe action figures or something kind of slides up and there's their like their background. <laughs> I like that. I like yeah. that a lot. I mean, I could see immediately how I would make the film of this, you know, where I would just break in those things and kind of give that, you know, the highlight of that person. Uh, but thinking about it from a, a pacing standpoint where you are kind of giving these these pieces of context, how did you approach that? Again, I like to always think about like editorial um, input. You were talking about like, you know, the, the shift from those first drafts into the later ones. Thinking about the fact that you have something that does move this fast, you're inevitably going to slow down a little bit anytime you hit those moments where you have to kind of fill in the background. What was your thinking and approach to that? What was the editorial feedback? How did that work for you? You know, there, this question's got a two-part answer. The first is to do with info dumps. You'll see a very common writing rule, you know, Avoid info dumps. They're bad for the reader. And my response is, that rule was written by people who suck at writing info dumps. <laughs> I, I like info dumps because you can write them so they are fun to read and so they keep the pace up. My response is, if you, if you think you shouldn't do info dumps and you don't like info dumps, learn to write better info dumps. Don't be scared of them. So I have no problem with stopping the action for a second and doing a G.I. Joe back-of-the-box action figure, which I'm going to use, by the way. That is great. Um, <laughs> As long as it's fun to read and as long as it's exciting. I mean, I'm not going to spend five or six pages diving into this character, but, you know, come on, a two or three, two or three paragraph little background. Like, I trust my reader to stick with me through that. Um, in terms of general pacing, pacing is a little bit of my Achilles heel, at least in my first drafts, as, you know, my editor Anna will absolutely attest to. But it's very rarely the info dumps where the pacing is the problem. It's often a case of where I just have a character or a particular section that is slightly slower than the rest. Not necessarily an info dump section, but like a section where a character is deciding what to do or there's a bit more of a discussion between characters. That's where my editor goes, okay, look, you need to pick up the pace here a little bit. This is this is slowing down a little bit. And she's always bang on the money because she's smart as hell. But no, info dumps, I like doing them. They're fun. I think I do them well. I'm definitely not scared of them. Bring them on. I think you know, the traditional wisdom has always been the, you know, the show don't tell. And I think yeah. I've seen a lot more pushback on that lately because one, sometimes telling just works better. Sometimes delivering a piece of information that you can do concisely and entertainingly is a lot better than having to deal like with unnecessary scenes that have to show exactly a dynamic versus having a character just being like, oh, this is our relationship. This is all you need to know and moving on. Yeah. Particularly for me, and again, this is a thing that I, I, I beat the drum on a lot on the show, but um, I don't have the attention span or the space in my life right now for books that are a thousand pages long. I, I like things that get to the point. Um, and so for me, having you know that record scratch and being like, okay, this is what you need to know. Are you caught up? Cool. And then keep going is far better for me than a number of extra pages and scenes that only serve to illuminate one small thing that could have been delivered more succinctly. So I think that a, a strategic info dump can help pacing a ton. Again, like you said, if you know what you're doing with it and it doesn't suck and you make it work. So yeah, I like, I like how you approached all that. I want to talk about to you about Tegan's little uh, sort of found family 
I think if if this uh, this novel has some tropes that it hits, I mean, certainly, I guess, like telekinesis and superpowers is a trope in and of itself. Found family is definitely one that has become more and more popular in books recently, although I think it's always been a thing. We just didn't necessarily have a name for it. Um, what can you tell us about this little dysfunctional government operative group that she's a part of and how that conflicting relationship informs both her everyday life in working and then also kind of gets the plot going because you kind of mentioned earlier having superpowers can be a good thing from the standpoint of people want you on their team, but a bad thing if they never trust you because you're the, the odd person out who can do something they can't. With China shop, Tegan's crew, not all of them are being forced to be there, but plenty of them for plenty of them. It's their only option. They don't really have any other options, but to work for this crew. So there's a good chunk of them that are simply like, I don't want to be here. This sucks. I hate this Tegan person. She's a fucking ass. I, I get she has superpowers. Okay, cool. I hate being around her. To me, that's that dynamic is kind of fun. To, to briefly, should I briefly break down who's on the team? Would that help? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, cool. So we have Annie Cruz, who is a former gangster, um, who has a record as long as her arm and is not, it's unlikely to get legit employment anytime soon, so this is a good option for her. Uh, we've got Paul Marino, who's a an ex-Navy quartermaster who is up to his ears in debt and who is a giant pain in the ass because he's super detail-minded and gets really annoyed when the others aren't. We've got Regina McCormick, who is an incomplete quadriplegic. She is a former helicopter pilot um, who was paralyzed in a crash and is now the team's hacker and also leader. And we have Carlos Jesus Lopez Morales, always have to say his full name, who is uh, a Mexican driver um, and is Tegan's best friend. And we've also got Africa, who is seven foot tall Senegalese immigrants, former homeless dude, and is also part of the team. So we have this big collection of, of motley characters, none of whom are really all that invested, with possible exception of Reggie, all that invested in being there for them to actually work together as a team, because a lot of them don't have any other choice, means that they kind of have to get over themselves and they've got to figure them out. It's not just Tegan who's got to learn to love her newfound family. It's all of them who've got to figure out that, yeah, look, we're stuck with each other. We may as well not be complete assholes to each other. And that's definitely like the the growing dynamic I think that people will attach themselves to when they read stories like this, is to see people who don't necessarily get on to begin with and a lot of that is because they carry their own baggage they carry their own levels of mistrust and uh circumstances kind of have to force them past that i mean the, the sort of the the thing that kicks off the first novel is that somebody ends up dead that could only have died by use of psychokinesis and the only right. person they know who's done it um is tegan and she was near this person around the time when it happened and immediately the entire team's like why'd you go kill this guy now everything's screwed and now the government's coming for us and and she has to be like i that i absolutely was not the person who did that and i was somewhere else with this going on but you can see that everybody immediately turns on her um and i think that most people who i don't know went to high school or had friends in college or had any type of contentious relationship with people around them had a moment where people turned and looked at them and blamed something on them without them having done it or even been anywhere near that circumstance whether it was just being accused of oh we heard you hooked up with so and so and you're like i did not hook up with so and so i would have known i would have been there and it didn't happen there are things like that and then you're trying to chase off a person's preconceived notion because they've already made up their mind of something um so it, it feels very true to life while being alongside some really crazy uh, out there things which i think is very cool antagonist wise the f the first novel We've got somebody who who feels like a reflection of Tegan. The second novel we get, I'm not even sure how to talk about the second novel's <laughs> uh, antagonist because it, it's going to sound so absurd coming from me. So I'm going to let you address that. And then um, because, again, we don't want to give away too much of, of the events that happen in each novel. But I think that the bad guys are always a big draw. So I, what can you kind of tell me about them in all three of these? All right, well, I'm going to skip the third one. The third one's out in a couple of months. No spoilers there. I'm not spoiling a single thing about the third one. I will talk about the first two books. In the first book, the antagonist is a guy named Jake Mason, um, who is, as you say, he's Tegan's mirror image. He, too, has psychokinesis. Um, he doesn't know where he got it. He is desperate to find out more about his own past. That's what drives him. And he is essentially manipulated by another character 
into doing some seriously fucked up shit. Jake is very sad for me. He's a guy who could have had a life that was a lot like Tegan's. He could have been in the same situation Tegan was in, which for however much Tegan, however much stress Tegan goes through isn't bad. But instead, he's just this outcast in society, and he's just convinced that no one is ever going to understand what he's going through. So I feel desperately sad for him, and I did when I wrote the, when I wrote the book as well. And you know, I, I kept thinking, even at the point where he was finally going head to head with Tegan, I was thinking it didn't have to be this way. Like poor guy. With the second book, I the the and the antagonist is his name is Matthew Schenke. He's four years old. He is a prodigy. He's one of those kids with a super high IQ. He also happens to have the ability to manipulate earth with his mind, rocks, dirt, and soil. Uh, a reader came up with the term geokinetic, which is something that I saw and went, "Damn, I should have used that." <laughs> um, and he's also a total sociopath. So when he finds out that he has the ability to cause earthquakes. Um, that is when things get interesting. You, you talk about him being absurd. But I'm assuming because he's he's you know a, a super genius kid. My response to that is, well, these kids exist. It's, you know, there are many many documented cases of kids who are able to read by the time they're one and a half years old, who are speaking in complete sentences, who are doing complex math problems. These kids happen. What if one of them a had superpowers, natural abilities, and b was a fucking sociopath? I could absolutely see this happening. He wasn't originally going to be a kid. He was originally just going to be sort of Jake's age or Tegan's age and maybe a little younger, sort of late teens, early 20s. But I looked at this as I was writing and went, hold on, I can't actually do this. First of all, A, it's boring, and B, it doesn't quite work with the backstory of this particular world. So what if I did it when he was a little kid and it was like a light bulb going off? It was like, oh, I see this kid. I know exactly who this kid is. And he was so much fun to write. Oh my goodness, he was a delight. He scared the piss out of me while I was writing him because he was just, I mean, this, it, it, you know, pun intended, he was a force of fucking nature. And so to have this bad guy who scared the shit out of me and who I think, judging by the reaction, has scared the shit out of a lot of readers, that's hugely rewarding. You'll see in the third book, the absurdity gets dialed down just a little bit. I don't want this to be a kind of escalating how how crazy can we can we make this kind of thing but yeah Matthew this little 4-year-old geokinetic uh, I'm proud of him I I'm you're spot on that like uh, kids in general um some of them don't uh form a an uh, ethical or empathetic compass until they get a little bit older. Um, kids are capable of intense cruelty and incredible yes. selfishness. And we see that on such a small scale with them, it's just as they treat other people or how they react to their parents or, um, you know, how they lose their minds when they don't get their own way because they don't have all of those, those uh, filters built up that we learn over time. So exactly. having a kid who is both a genius, but also has immense power is the scariest thing th they would be, like you said, a force of nature. Um, um, and but then they raise, raises so many ethical questions because how do you fight a four year old? How do you actively Dang. combat somebody that's that dangerous and yet is that young? So that is a whole big quandary as well. So uh, I, oh, I, it's man. brilliant. I love yeah. it. That was the interesting thing for me. You've actually hit the nail on the head. There is well, how are you going to stop this kid? Are you going to kill him? You're going to be the one to point a gun at this kid and kill a four year old boy, a boy who may not fully understand what he's doing that was a hugely interesting question for me and i was really excited to find out how my characters and tegan in particular were going to react to this and i don't want to spoil the end of the book but yeah the, the decision that tegan has to make about this creates a really really interesting situation see i i like questions like this i like posing ethical questions like what would you do in this situation where there is no easy answer there is no right answer Anything you do is going to leave you scarred for fucking life. And I want to have my characters go through that because that's where you can really dig your teeth into a story. I want to swing around. I mean, we've been talking about craft this whole time, but I want to dig in. Like I noted before, I mean, this is your three novels deep into this series. You have quite a number of other books all, out already. What does your writing process look like? Are you an outliner? Are you a pantser discovery writer? Some sort of, you know, blend between? What's that look like for you? I've always been a bit of an outline. I do rough outlines. Um, it dates from when I was writing my first book and I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never written a novel before. So I was just like, well, I guess I'll just kind of like plot it out. I'll just like write down a kind of plan. 
and it worked and the book did pretty well and it, it got picked up and published by Orbit. And so I looked at this and went, well, clearly this is, this is working for me. I like this. So I'll do a very, very rough plan that will usually consist of a couple of lines per chapter of, right, in this chapter, uh, this person gets stabbed, this thing blows up, here's a witty quip that Tegan can say, here's a food reference and a rap reference that I can put in, uh, go. And I find it very useful as a roadmap in the sense that I'm constantly finding that I'm diverging from that plan and going off on these fun little side roads, um, which is great because when, you know, if I get stuck or lost, I've got that roadmap to come back to. I'm definitely not beholden to it. I don't plot out every line of dialogue and every character movement because characters constantly surprise me. It may turn out that I wanted a particular character to do something and I get to that point and the character just goes, the fuck I want to do that for. I, I like surprises like that, so I'm not beholden to it. Um, so yeah, I've, I'm, I am a plotter, but not religiously so. Do you have any type of specific uh, I don't know, uh, like f structure or format that you use? Whether that's like a traditional three or four act structure, or a lot of people use like save the cat or seven uh, seven point or anything like that. Is there anything like that figuring? No, God, no, absolutely not. Um, I'm very, very wary about relying on certain structures to build a story. I mean, I, I get that they work and they're there for good reason, um, but I never want to say to a story, "Hey, you need to fit inside this particular structure because the story is going to turn around and bite me in the ass." Um, the story will go where the story needs to go. I have to trust in my storytelling ability to get me to the end. I have to trust in my editor's ability to tell me where I've gone wrong, and I have to trust in my readers. I don't trust a story framework that was developed in a writing course somewhere. No matter how qualified the person was developing it, I don't trust that to fit my story. I trust my own ability, and I always have. And then what are your tools of the trade? What do you write in, uh, whether it's software or you know analog techniques, anything like that? Um, I use a, a software program called Scrivener, which I'm sure you've heard of before. Um, I use maybe 5% of its features. It can be very deep and very complex. I don't really use most of that. I just like it because I, it can display all my chapters along one side and all, all my research material as well. So I, you know, if I, if I need to look something up, I'm never far from it. Um, but other than that, not a lot. I mean, I have a big notepad document in the Scrivener file where I just write down, you know, stuff I want to remember. I work through plot problems. That always ends up being, you know, twelve or 13,000 words along by the time the book is finished. But outside of that, I don't have any tools. I might write down stuff in a, a little actual physical notebook now and then. But no, nah, mostly it's just me, my keyboard and Scrivener. Well, I'm I'm a big fan of Scrivener. I use it every day and use it for a lot of different kinds of things. Um, and I evangelize for that tool all the time. But I agree, like there's so much under the hood. Like, just use what you need uh, and, exactly. and not a bit more. I think uh, I'm trying to remember if it was like if it was Cass Morris or somebody who was on the show a while back who was talking about like, oh, you can do this color coding thing, and there's this metadata, so you can search things easier and whatever. And I was like, mm. there's metadata? What? You know? And yeah, exactly. I had no idea. No idea. <laughs> Someday I'll try it, maybe. But. Uh, that's then making time to try to figure out how to continuously develop the process, which can be useful. But at the same time, if you've got what works, you stick with what works. Well, like I said um, at the top, I mean, so this this book is is, is three novels deep. Um, at the time when this uh, episode comes out, I think it's a it'll be a little ahead of when the um, third novel drops. Um, is this a finite trilogy? Are we looking at an ongoing series? Is there more to come in the Frost Files after this? Way more to come. Matt, as we're doing this conversation, about a week ago, I just finished writing the fourth book. I just nice. finished the zero draft of that. I am going to write this series for as long as readers will keep buying it and as long as readers will keep enjoying it. I am having the time of my fucking life with this series. I've, I've never written a, a set of characters before that makes me so happy on a daily basis, even in the trenches, even on the worst day of writing, I'm still having just an absolute ball. So, you know, every book in this series ideally should function as a standalone. You should be able to jump in wherever you want. You're not going to, uh, that may be, become a little harder as the series goes on and, you know, more stuff, more water passes under the bridge. But I want to keep writing this series for as long as I can. And I'm, I'm, you know, I think the series has been doing pretty well. Uh, my hope is that Orbit will want to continue with it. But yeah, it's it's a total blast. It's definitely not a definitely not a series with an end. It's going to keep going. 
Well, also, I think that will make fans very happy. Uh, I, I think especially things that serials that, that go on, like people stick with their characters. I, those are the kinds of things you see on bookshelves for a long time. When you go into the bookstores, you see them gather because there's when people find a world that they really like, they, they like to stick around in it. And so having more material is very, very exciting. The Girl Who Could Move Shit With Her Mind is the first novel that's out now. Uh, Random Shit Flying Through the Air is a second novel that's out now. Eye of the Shitstorm is the third novel. I don't have a physical copy of that one yet, but um, but I that, don't even um, have a physical copy of that one yet. It yeah. <laughs> doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> right, right. It's 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 in the digital ether until it appears in our hands. Uh, but by the time this episode drops, it'll either be out or be really close to being out, and people can get their hands on that one as well. Um, I will have links to all the stuff in the show notes and in the comment section. Um, and uh, and I'll have links to all of your various places where people can check out your stuff. Is there one specific locale that you think that they should check out online, which is the best place to follow you to keep up with all of your writing, everything that you put out, all that kind of stuff? Where's the central hub for you? Two places, really. You can follow me on Twitter or Instagram, either. They've got the same handle, which is at Real Jackson Ford. Um, and JacksonFordAuthor.com. I don't have a blog on there. Uh, necessarily but if you want information on me and my books that's where to go otherwise for a random stream of consciousness recipes uh hip-hop references that no one but me gets uh come follow me on twitter awesome well jackson rob whatever we want to call you thanks for uh showing up on brand with no sleeves i was wondering we were going into this it's winter but i was like it's it's not it's not your experience unless there is a uh a basketball jersey uh involved so that made me happy to see as well yep. help people check this stuff out because it's so much fun uh and they keep going with it and thank you so much for joining me on fictitious thank you for having me man this has been fun